Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back so today we will discuss that real life oligopoly market okay and as we mentioned in the last lecture uh, we will specifically uh, confine our discussion in this course to only duopoly case okay duopoly means two producers are there in the market okay let me clarify one thing in oligopoly market as you understand that since few producers are there in the market okay as we told their strategic interaction is very important right to capture the as much as market share each of the player will try to do that right so that is why how strategically behave uh, each of them okay to maximize their individual profit only okay i am a player i will try to maximize my profit you are you are another player you will try to your uh, maximize your profit and that profit maximization will indirectly depends on how much market share you are capturing or you are able to capture right so everybody is trying to grab as much as market share he or she can can grab in that way they are looking for and as more and more market share you can grab accordingly your profit will increase so that is the target and in that process how strategic interaction seems very important what kind of strategies can be there that we have introduced using game theory and certain terminologies like nash equilibrium like dominant strategies and so on we also introduced uh, certain specific type of games right prisoner's dilemma and then battle of sexes okay those two games specifically exclusively we have discussed here and some other games we have mentioned right so, battle arm race between ussr and us usa okay then uh, hawk dub game okay scorp uh, frog scorpion game uh, kidnapper hostage game so many these kinds of games are there very interesting okay each of them okay but provided that you are you are get, getting additional interest beyond the scope of this course okay you can look at and you can uh, read uh, you can try to understand what kind of game involved and also right so here we will discuss mostly prisoners dilemma game so for that let us discuss cartel cartel what is cartel we will define now and then we will discuss uh, if two people because we are cons confining ourselves to a duopoly kind of case so two producers are there in the market and they are trying to form a cartel okay then what will be their decision making or optimum quantity decision and all that we will discuss before that let me clarify one thing look what is the basic difference between say oligopoly market and monopolistically competitive market monopolistically competitive market there are large number of sellers are there but each of the sellers monopolistically competitive market okay so each of the sellers does are are, are are dealing with single product so i have one product you have some different product okay in that way everybody has some monopoly right over his or her own product okay and that is why everybody has a downward sloping uh, demand curve okay all producer faces a downward Uh, stopping demand curve for its product by the potential customers right so they are uh, in uh, monopolistically competitive market uh, that uh, product differentiation distinguished product product differentiation is one uh, important characteristics or important phenomena of that kind of market oligopoly market suppose uh, say six producers are there few few sellers are there no we told in a oligopoly market suppose that few the number is six six or five right so that few is implication as we as we clarified in the last lecture that its implication of that few quote and quote terminology few its implication is that each of the producer actually occupies significant or quite worthwhile fraction of the market share okay and as a result it has quite worthwhile contribution in the or, or effect on the determination of equilibrium price in that market right now this strategic interaction among the players and all that can depends on two factors in this case one of course the number of producers okay as less and less number of producers are there each of them will have relatively more and more market share right that is the one side of the story another side of the story is that if product is differentiated vis a vis uh, homogeneous product 
suppose these six producers are there in the market, they are dealing with uh, six different products if it is a say monopolistically competitive market, they are dealing with say maybe same product or identical product or homogeneous product. So, if homogeneous product they are dealing right, then so since the same product and perfect information is there to the every customers right, everybody has to set the same price because if I set little bit more price than the other people uh, other producers right, nobody will come to buy to my, my, my product right or more, nobody will visit my shop to buy product from me right because homogeneous product. So, in that case strategic interaction will be even more significant and very powerful it will be ok strategic interaction how strategic interaction plays a vital role in that case vis a vis if they say they are dealing with say monopolistically competitive kind of market they are say ok ok ok. So, we are assuming say for instance we are assuming for example, say six sellers ok. Suppose these six sellers are operating with either homogeneous product or differentiated product, differentiated product, products rather ok. So, since only limited number of sellers are there 6 or 5 something like that right, strategic interaction plays a very important role in both the cases. Because each of the sellers has to compete even if it is differentiated product, but product is the same type like the bath soap example we told product is the bath soap. One fellow perhaps producing lux bath soap, another producer is producing live boy bath soap, another producer is producing say PR bath soap in that way right. So, in any case it is the same bath soap market each of them has to uh, decide very carefully very judiciously so that th their market share should not be affected significantly right ok. So, that is uh, my point is so long they are de they are uh, dealing in the market with differentiated product the kind of strategic interactions effect on optimum price decision ok. If they they dealing with vis a vis if they do deal with say homogeneous product strategic interaction will have even much more larger role no because here are the same product. So, I am I am I should not be just a little bit careful about uh, my price rather I have to be extremely careful. And I should uh, nobody none of the, this producers should set any price above the other people's uh, price what they are setting right by the virtue of the homogeneous product. So, so the kind of message we are getting with this discussion that when they are dealing with all the few number of sellers are there in the market when they are dealing with differentiated product the implication of strategic interaction among themselves the, uh, whatever the extent of implication is there on the market equilibrium if they deal with homogeneous product the Im Im implication of uh, strategic interaction will be much more larger ok extent will be much more uh, severe right. So, to, to confine our attention only to strategic interaction ok. We are assuming that this kind of oligopoly market or the duopoly kind of market what we are going to deal with ok that, that the producers are dealing with the homogeneous product where strategic interaction is the only source of their decision making when they are going to decide their optimum price or optimum quantity to maximize profit only right. In this case strategic interaction as well as product differentiation. So, everybody enjoy some sort of monopoly right right. So, that is why little strategic interaction has a role there of course, but monopoly right will safeguard to some extent right that is not the case here ok. Here only homogeneous product. So, they have to be very careful about strategic interaction. So, let me repeat let me let me summarize. Uh, to confine our attention only to strategic interaction, we are ruling out the possibility of product differentiation. And that is why we are assuming that the uh, one oligopoly market which we are discussing now or more specifically one duopoly market which we are going to discuss now, they are that uh, product what these two producers are producing is homogeneous product we are assuming 
okay now let us go to the specific uh, model so so this kind of homogeneous product right see pepsi and coca cola two different brands they are not homogeneous product technically speaking if as per the homogeneity definition in economics right but they are so close uh, substitute to each other right uh, let us assume that that kind of situation two uh, equ almost equally powerful producers are there in the market okay and each of them are struggling or fighting strategically among themselves okay to grab as much market share they can uh, capture okay in that way see you know that uh, this pepsi and coca cola what example we are giving no to uh, worldwide duopolist okay uh, you know that the soft they are producing uh, soft drinks no so so people or potential customers choice for soft drink if you know actually the color of the soft drink uh, plays an important role okay maybe i i may like say white color soft drink okay you may like say black color soft drink some of your friend may like maybe orange color soft drink okay and since different people have different kind of choices different kind of taste towards this kind of different colors none of those companies know they want to lose any of the customers and that is why you will realize that each of them have all colors of product pepsi has pepsi its brand is called pepsi what is pepsi cola they are producing what black color soft drink okay and coca cola they are producing some black color soft drink that is sometimes coca cola sometimes another brand is called thumbs up uh, thumbs up i think okay this is the spelling thumbs up okay you, if you see similarly each of them have some uh, white color one has some seven up one of them producing seven up another another of them may be sprite something like that white color each of them have some uh, orange color uh, uh, product i think one is called fanta another is called mirinda like that okay so each of the producer is producing each of the colors product so none of them actually wants to lose the customer who is, who may be liking for a particular color product okay so each of them are fiercely compete very very uh, what should i say cut throat kind of competition they are engaged into okay to capture as much market they, they can okay now suppose for the simplicity see suppose two producers you, you and me we are producing same product homogeneous product and we are serving in the same market right so who is more powerful to compete among ourselves of course whose cost structure is less if you can remember uh, we, we we mention also sometimes back if you can produce the same product in the lower cost relatively lower cost okay so you are more efficient right means e same product no we can engage into price competition also right suppose whatever the cost structure we have right uh, per hours per unit price should be 15 rupees okay but i can make it 14 rupees because i have a cost advantage over you so if we engage in that way price competition i am making 14 rupees then you are making 13 rupees like that we are competing in a setting price so after a threshold level no when the who, the person who has the lowest uh, cost structure or out of you and me right he can be sustained after a, some point but other person who can't sustain any anymore okay if you engage in that so uh, through that example actually i am trying to give a message that as you have less and less cost structure you have more and more bargaining power across yourselves between you two parties right so to assume that each of them are equally strong we are assuming that each of them cost, cost structure is same okay and and we are assuming that say suppose marginal cost equals to zero for each of them mc equals to zero okay some of you can think of sir how marginal cost is zero additional unit uh, when we are producing how cost of production of that additional unit how can, zero it can be okay it should be some positive so we are assuming zero for simplicity you can assume positive my marginal cost also 2 rupee his marginal cost also 2 rupee the basic idea is that we are we want to assume that cost structure is same to tell that each of them are having equal bargaining power in that way right now 
in any case real life also cost structure zero marginal cost kind of thing is there. I can give you an example say sand, sand is an essential ingredient for building no building new building and all building material right. Okay, construction of new building sand is one uh, important ingredient right. Do you know how this sand is uh, comes? Okay, because sand is uh, produced or collected from river bed okay. and uh, different states of India if you see the different uh, states are actually the owner of those river bed where sand mining is allowed. Okay. So, sand mining, so sand quarries are there specific places of river bed. Okay, those quarries usually government lease, give lease to certain parties. Okay, so, suppose I am a lease holder, I took lease of, of one sand quarry from the government, right. So, I have to give specific amount of fee that uh, license fee kind of thing what, uh, whatever government said. Okay, I give that to government and then I, I, I occupy that person for say maybe next 10 years or something like that. The way a government gives the lease, right. Now, I have uh, two laborers, they are my permanent employee. Okay, I hired them for say next one year and every day I am paying them say maybe 500 rupees wage rate. Okay. So, but how much sand I will I will extract from that sand query okay, per day that depends on that particular day how much demand for sand is there to me. So, suppose one day demand is say 8 bags of sand, tomorrow suppose that demand is 15 bags of sand, same query. I already paid that whatever the license fee I, I paid the government that is like, like a fixed cost, right. Okay. So, when one day I am extracting 8 bag of sand, vis a vis another day I am extracting 15 bag of sand, my cost is not increasing at all. Same laborers, I am using them to extract same two laborers, they are my permanent employee kind of thing. Next one year I, I hired them and every day I am paying, even if one day there is no sand demand from my shop, right, I have to pay them 500 rupee per day. Okay. So, this is a very specific kind of very extreme kind of example I am giving, but looking at the example you can understand, one day you are extracting 10, 10 bags of sand, another day next day you are extracting say 12 bags of sand. Two additional bags of sand when you are extracting, no, you are not incurring any additional cost. Okay, same labor force, same license fee you have you paid already to the government. So, this kind of very uh, peculiar kind of special kind of example in real life you can see where marginal cost can be also 0 in this kind of situation. Okay. So, forget about that part, this, this example I am giving to, to, to uh, clarify some of your curiosity who may have a curiosity that uh, how it can be. Okay. It can happen although it is a rare possibility. Okay. Anyway, so we are assuming both of them have the marginal cost is 0. Suppose, so now these two producers, if they form a cartel, what will be their target? So, let us discuss what is cartel. Cartel is basically uh, where you and me, wh whatever the producers are there, they are negotiating themselves in the beginning. Okay, and they are jointly deciding that quantity of output to produce jointly by themselves, so that their total profit is maximized. So, sometimes it is called industry profit, industry profit or entire market profit, this should be maximized. That is the motive of to form a cartel, industry profit is maximized. Now, Suppose they are forming a cartel, right? Suppose they know that demand for that product what they are producing, demand by the potential customers, demand for that product is given by say P equals to 30 minus Q. This Q is the market quantity and that Q whatever they are going to produce that they will share among themselves. So, if this kind of demand curve, so essentially this kind of demand curve means if you measure quantity this side, price this side, this is 30. Okay. So, this kind of market demand curve, market demand curve is there, which is a straight line whose slope is minus 1, slope is minus 1 and vertical intercept is 30. If this is the market demand curve, our target is to maximize our joint profit, two of us we are forming a cartel. Since we are forming a cartel, our target 
to maximize entire industry profit. So, we will make MR equals to MC. So, if this is the price situation, this is the demand curve or price line, demand curve we told that that is also the price line, right? Because this line is telling if you produce this much of quantity of output, you can set price per unit of output this much. Alternatively, if you want to produce this much of output, you can set this much of price per unit of output and so on, right? So, this is price line basically. What is the demand curve? That is price line also, okay? So, to maximize profit, what is the condition MR equals to MC? Now, we assume that MC equals to 0, each of them, right? So, what is the MR? If price equals to 30 minus Q, so total revenue will be price into Q, that is the total revenue, that must be 30 minus Q whole into Q. So, that is basically 30 Q minus Q square. So, MR is basically del TR del Q by definition change in total revenue due to change in quantity. So, that will be basically 30 minus twice Q if you take the derivative of this way. So, this MR equals to MC for profit maximization. So, MR equals to MC is telling that 30 minus 2 Q equals to MC is 0, 0. So, if you solve this 2 Q is 30 or Q equals to 15. So, they are deciding among themselves that if we jointly produce 15 units of output okay, and when Q equals to 15 say suppose this is 15 units of output, how much price per unit of output they can set? They are plugging in this thing into this equation. So, price optimum price should be so this is Q star they should produce jointly and optimum star will be 30 minus that Q star. Okay. So, Q star is 15, so it is 15. So, they are each of them have the same MC, its implication is that each of them are equally powerful, equal have equal bargaining power because none of them have any cost or advantage over the other part producer, right? So, if they want to maximize the industry's joint profit, they should produce 15 units of output and together and perhaps they will share equally 7.5 units of output each. Why 7.5 units each? Because they have the same bargaining power. Otherwise, whose bargaining power is more? Perhaps he will say, say suppose uh, my bargaining power is more, my cost structure is little bit less than yours your cost structure. So, perhaps I will produce 8 units, you will produce 7 units or I will produce 10 units, you will produce 5 units depending on what is our relative bargaining power. In that way, they will distribute. Since your bargaining power is same, same cost structure each of them. So, we are assuming that perhaps they will equally share. So, what will happen? So, I will produce 7.5 units, you will also produce 7.5 units and total 15 units as, as, a, as, a, as a market we together produce 15 units of output and we will sell each of our product in uh, say 15, uh, 15 rupee per, uh, per, per quantity or per unit quantity, okay? that is the thing. Okay? So, if that is the case, what will be our profit structure? Look at here. Say suppose I am producing 7.5 units you are also producing 7.5 units. So, what will be my profit? My profit will be 7.5 unit I am producing into 15 that is my total revenue because 15 is the price that is my total revenue and my total cost is 0 we are assuming marginal cost if you integrate marginal cost is 0 if you integrate it will be 0. So, whatever the total revenue that is the total profit we are assuming we are we are assuming that my total cost is 0 and a special case. So, if you do that it will be 112.5. So, I can get 112.5, you can get also 112.5 that much profit. Alternatively, look at here, each of them have a cheating motive, no? So, suppose I am saying, okay, we together sit and we decided that I will produce 7.5 units and he will produce 7.5 units. If I produce little bit more, what will happen? Assuming that he will not cheat. So, suppose, so this, this is person 1 and that is person 2. Okay. So, suppose when person 1 is honoring, he is producing 7.5 units. If person 2 cheat, suppose person 2 is as you, uh, uh, trying to produce 8.5 units because no, none of them are uh, becoming watchdog to other. No. So, who is producing 7.5 units? So, what will happen? 
I am producing, I am honoring the cartel negotiated quantity that which we have decided jointly. So, I am producing 7.5 units and you are producing 8.5 units. The total production is 16 units, 7.5 plus 8.5, 16 units. So, if we want to sell that 16 unit in the market, market will only give 14 rupee per price. If we, if we push this 16 unit into the market demand curve, no, that will give you so maximum price 14 rupee. Okay. So, what will happen? So, who is producing 7.5 units or who is honoring the cartel negotiated output, he will get this mass of total revenue that is the profit. And who is, who is, uh, uh, who is cheating the trying to cheat the partner, he will get 8.5 into 14 unit that will be total revenue also profit. So, you look at what will be this thing. So, 14 and 7. So, who is going to cheat, who is honoring, he will get 105 and who is cheating, he will get this thing 14 into 8.5. So, one one nine. Okay, exactly that way if person 2 owners produce so if he produce 8.5, he will get 119 and who is honoring, he will get 105. Exactly this way, if this person produce 8.5 and he produce 7.5, so definitely this person is cheating, so he will get 119 and he will get 105. And if each of them cheat, what will happen? Total output will be 8.5 into 8.5 plus 8.5, so 17. So, equilibrium price will be 13. So, each of their thing will be the 13 into 8.5. Okay, if you calculate, one one ten point five, one one ten point five, one one ten point five. Okay. So look at here what is happening. They know that if I produce seven point five and my rival, my my competitor produce seven point five, each of us will get. 112.5, 112.5. But each of them have a cheating motive to others, and what they are thinking when nearly they are assuming if I cheat, my partner will not cheat. This person is assuming. This person also similarly foolishly nearly assuming that when I am cheating, trying to cheat the partner, partner will not cheat. So, as a result, what is happening? Look at here, these two, if you compare, this 119 is more than 112.5, exactly that way. 110.5 is more than 105. So, person 1 has a cheating motive. So, the 8.5 is a dominant strategy. Exactly same way if you see that person 2, he is comparing these two numbers. Both the cases he is getting more here. So, each of them have a cheating motive. As a result, they are landing here. So, you can understand it is clearly a prisoner's dilemma kind of game involved. So, each of them sit together each of them decide that I will produce 7.5, you will produce 7.5 and we can extract maximum profit. But the cheating motive lending them, each of them to land in a wrong or less amount of profit, each of them. Here, each of them can get 112.5, actually they are getting 110.5, okay, two units of profit they are uh, losing, right. So, this cheating motive is involved because of in cartel, that is why cartel is not that much stable. Why? See, you can remember when that OPEC cartel we discussed, we told that in the long run actually petroleum, uh, petroleum product is becoming less and less and uh, more and more elastic to the customers. As a result, their, uh, their revenue is, was falling and they cannot maintain the high price for long. But this kind of uh, prisoner's dilemma game also involved. Everybody, all the OPEX members, they decided, no, Saudi Arabia, I will produce 1000 units of output per, per day, say maybe Venezuela, I will produce say 500 units per day. In that way, uh, depending on their production capacity, they, they distributed what, how much, who, who should produce. But each of them, if try to produce little bit more than the quota allotted or they negotiated amount, okay. So, eventually price will fall down because of this cheating motive. And when that will happen, no, each of them will suspect perhaps other person is actually cheating us. 
Okay. So, in that way cartel is very unstable kind of thing and cartel will break. This is another reason, this may be another reason why OPEC cannot maintain high price long for long because that cheating motive actually is making everybody to produce little bit more. Okay. This is one thing and I will tell another message here. See, suppose say I am telling, so we know that we have cheating motive that is why we will eventually break the cartel. Each of us, we know that if we break the cartel, we will, we will land in a worse situation than which we can gain here, better situation, right? But our cheating motive will force us to do uh, land here. So, if suppose we will employ one, one watchdog, okay? So, I will give one rupee and he will also give one rupee. So, two rupees is the salary of that watchdog. So, if I do that, that watchdog will make sure that we are not cheating. Whenever I am going to produce more than 7.5, he will tell no, you can't do that. Okay? So, he will make sure that none of us are cheating. So, ultimately I will get 112.5, here I could get 110.5, from that I will pay 1 rupee to that watchdog. Exactly my rival, he will also pay 1 rupee to that watchdog. So, still we can get benefit, 1 rupee extra, because in that case we are getting say 1, 1, 1 1.5, because this minus 1. That is for me, that is for you as well. Okay, exactly that was happening. Actually, 1970s, uh, there was a Japanese cars demand was there huge in US market. Okay, so what happened? There is a trade negotiation between Japan and US. So, it is basically import by the US of the Japanese car. Okay, so there is a trade negotiation and US is telling that no, 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 we will, we will restrict import. Okay, and Japan is telling, since Japan is exporter, Japan is telling them no, 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 trade should be free. So, in that way there is a negotiation and eventually Japan is, US, US told that no, 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 we will impose some restriction, then Japan told that okay, then you impose some quota and US, uh, US agreed that okay, and eventually they told that okay, per year not more than 1000 units of car uh, US will import from Japan, that is the quota. So, Japan cannot export more than 1000 units of car per year. So, what will happen actually when that quota restriction is there? No, Japanese car market actually was a cartel, few say Kia, Suzuki like that few uh, producers were there. So, when this 1000 is the quota amount, they distribute accordingly among themselves. So, this much car I will Kia will produce that much car will Suzuki will produce and so on. And when, and that they told the US government that Kia will produce this much, uh, Kia will sell in the US in this much, uh, Suzuki will export to US this much in that way then whenever any of them are going to ex sell little bit more to US market, US government is telling them no, you are not allowed to produce uh, sell that more than that. So, cartel kind of Japanese market, okay, they could extract more price. Okay, look at here, if they can manage the cartel, the price could be 15. When cartel is broken, price be becoming 14 or 13 depend on how much output they are producing. So, US government was giving that service of watchdog freely to the Japanese car market. As a result, huge amount of money Japanese car makers actually extracted from US market by uh, keeping the uh, car price little bit above. Okay. So, here we are getting another message that see the, the country who is putting quota as restriction to uh, restrict their import, they are losing. Here US customers has to pay more because they are purchasing Japanese car. Okay. So, although See, we have discussed sometimes back neither quota nor tariff should be imposed uh, on the import to re import restriction, right? We have proved that. Even between quota and tariff, quota is more damaging. Here, instead of quota, if US government impose some tariff on Japanese market, at least US government can earn some tariff revenue which they can invest into US car market for their research and development activities, right? So, both are detrimental or both are not beneficial, rather they are harmful to the country who is impose, going to impose quota or tariff. Between this quota and tariff, quota is more damaging rather because of this kind of things, because you do not know from where you are importing whether that market is cartel or not. And when you are importing, imposing that some quota restriction, quantity restriction, actually this watchdog kind of thing what we have discussed here, no, 
the country who is imposing quota, they are freely giving that watchdog service. Okay. So, in that way, in that way, so quota we should not impose or that. So, so, and in this way basically that any cartel is basically very unstable. Okay. So, with that we, we will stop or we will finish, uh, we, we actually finished our entire microeconomics discussion and next uh, class onwards we will we start our macroeconomics discussion. Please look at in your book certain other things are there, what should be the government policy towards oligopoly market and all, you uh, nothing much to understand there, you just uh, story uh, reading kind of thing, you can read and you can understand what different policies government can take. Okay. Let us stop here.